Biobalance HealthCast, episode 223. Low estrogen is not the only cause of hot flashes. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. I'm Brett Newcomb and this is Dr. Kathy Moffat. This week we're going to be talking about uh, something that has to do with common wisdom. There are things that everybody knows. Just from growing up in a culture, being in a communication surround, there is what is called conventional wisdom or common wisdom. We just know stuff, but we haven't read about it, we haven't studied it, we haven't done any research. Somewhere we just absorbed it and now we believe it. And one example of things that we believe and things that we know that has a great deal of truth but is not totally accurate is our, our beliefs about uh, hot flashes and what hot flashes are, uh, where they come from, what causes them, who gets them, what, why they're a problem, and various ways to try to approach treating them. What we want to talk about today is all that may well be true, but there are other reasons that people get hot flashes. And we want to talk about what those are and how to spread the message that you should go beyond your assumptive belief. If you're having hot flashes or somebody that you care about is having hot flashes, it may be what you think it is. It may be but menopause. But it may not be what yeah. you think it is. So, so Kathy wants to, to tell us what she knows. Well, I want, I want to tell. Because you came up with a patient Right. Example. I want to tell about my, my yes. patient. Um, I had a patient that came in uh, recently who actually has been a patient of ours and has been getting hormone, estrogen, and testosterone pellets for several years. And she's a very involved patient. She likes to know what her labs are. She likes to have them explained to her. Some people come in and say, tell me it's okay. I'm fine with that. I don't get it, so just fix me. Right. But she wants she wants to know everything. And, she, and, and she's read my book, and she's gone through everything. But she had an interesting issue. She was great for the first year and a half. And then all of a sudden... She started having hot flashes. So, we at first, we bumped her estrogen without doing blood work. Then she still had them. And so she was concerned a month after her pellets, and pellets for women last four months, that she hadn't gotten enough estrogen, the pellet wasn't dissolving. She was certain because she had hot flashes, but no other symptoms of estrogen deprivation, that she had not gotten enough estrogen. So we did blood work. And it turns out that her blood work showed that she had more than enough estrogen and more than enough testosterone. And both of those hormones feed back from, from the bloodstream to the pituitary gland and shut off hot flashes for that reason, for, for that cause. Now, you have hot flashes from a lot of other reasons. So then she had been talking to my nurses, nurse practitioners who know everything and all my protocols and know exactly how to deal with this. But they came to me weeks before she came into my office and said, we don't know what to do next. You need to talk to her and you need to figure this out because that's what I do. So she... Um, you are the consummate medical detective. Yeah, I'm the med I'm the, I am the medical detective. So, so before she came in, I went through her entire record and looked through everything that she had told us, every single thing that had happened to her, because those are my clues. Mm -hmm. I looked at all of her lab done after each set of pellets, and I then reviewed in my mind other causes of hot flashes. So it's not exactly a hot flash, but it's kind of a sweaty surge, okay? So it may not be a hot flash like some women have discussed it where they get red. It may just be sweating for no apparent reason. It's not hot in the room. So, and it's usually limited. It's usually not you're hot all day mm -hmm. or you're hot all night. So when I looked through the different causes, they included um, a basically testosterone, if it's low, can cause a hot flash as well, even if you have normal estrogen. So she didn't have that. I had ruled that out. Hypothyroidism, if your thyroid's really low, then the stimulation hormone, TSH, surges to try to get your thyroid going. So oftentimes hypothyroid can give you a hot flash-like symptom. So I checked her thyroid. That wasn't, that wasn't an issue. So then I went through her, uh, we always look at um, 
adrenals, we look at cortisol levels. So a very low cortisol level with a very high stimulatory hormone called ACTH can cause a hot flash over and over again trying to get the cortisol to come up. Her cortisol was normal at 8 a.m. So so then I went to, it could be one of two things. It could Then I'm down to two issues. It could be an arrhythmia that when you get an arrhythmia and you start skipping beats, then you can get a, a flood of sweat and you can get red and it looks like a hot flash, but it's not necessarily a hot flash. It's it's from your heart. It's a... Um, so physiologically, it looks the same. All of these look They'll the same. They all present They all look same. like a hot flash from low estrogen, but right. and that's all we ever think about, low estrogen. Right. That's but an automatic. That's an automatic. So, so basically, the other option was if she had hypoglycemia. So oftentimes... Diabetics, especially type 1 diabetics, will get too much insulin and their blood sugar will drop precipitously and and they will get uh, a flush or a flood, kind of a nauseated kind of feeling to go along with it. And that often causes them to feel like they're having a hot flash. Well, if you're over 50 and you're a female and you're having these... Again, you just make you that don't, You think it's your estrogen. And there's many women out there listening to this or families of people listening to this who are saying, hmm, I wonder why, you know, mom's still having hot flashes, she's taking estrogen. It could be one of these other things which are all important to get right. fixed. Right. And we don't ever want to overlook another illness because we say, oh, it's just menopause. So we have to look into this. And that's what I did with her. So, so what this came down to was sitting down with her and going over her life. Right. Basically, everything that she had talked to us about, everything that I had written out, all of her lab tests, and reassuring her, her estrogen was more than plentiful. Her testosterone was more than plentiful. But you had her blood test to, to acquire right. that data. Yeah, I so did the blood test look at that. ahead of time so that I right. would have all the data so I didn't waste a visit. Right. I don't like wasting time with patients because they come in and they want an answer. Right. So I asked so for the... You. And I want an answer. Yeah. yeah. And so I asked for the blood work ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So that gave me all the information I needed when she came into my office. Then I, I still didn't have a good answer. I took her pulse. She wasn't having any arrhythmias at that time. But it's possible that she could have arrhythmias right. at another time that I wasn't really um, catching by just checking her pulse. So then I talked to her about her diet. Hypoglycemia can happen to people who are not diabetics. So, so can we take just a second and explain mm -hmm. the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Oh, yes. Sorry. Because people hear diabetes again, and I think they make a global assumption. Right. So type 1 diabetes is usually juvenile diabetes, not always. Mm -hmm. But it's a complete failure of the um, pancreas, and you don't make any insulin. Okay. So you have to have your insulin given to you, and that makes it... That makes it difficult to manage blood sugars because it's not a minute by minute adjustment like and your that's body a result does of for a you. Genetic anomaly. That's a, a, a thing you're born to. Well, the risk for it is is passed down. Right. Yet, um, in general, that's more of a type two diabetes. Usually, type two diabetes is more genetic, but they but they say that type one diabetes does have a genetic component. But it has to do with getting a virus that attacks your uh, that attacks your uh, okay. Pancreas. So because I was getting to the point of one of them is considered to be more a lifestyle issue. That's or, type two. That's type two. Type two diabetes, and that's for pe people who gain weight right. and gain enough weight or eat the wrong things, eat too much sugar, right. and then they um, they have a problem managing their blood sugar. So their blood sugar goes too high, but usually those people it goes too low as well. Right. Now, when we're talking about type 1 diabetes, which I talked about in the beginning, right. it's very common for type 1 diabetes patients to have their blood sugar go, go way up and then drop off such that they can't recover on their own. They need to take some orange juice. They need to have some sugar given because to them. Because their system won't reload or reestablish. Right. They, it won't equilibrate. So they have to have some sugar. Mm -hmm. So those are the type 1 diabetics. And I've seen that when I did, I've, I have a history of doing pediatric diabetic camps when I was in medical school. And I've seen the extreme of that when we check the kids at 2 o'clock in the morning to make sure they weren't going into, an ins we call it insulin reaction when somebody's blood sugar is really low. Yeah, my wife was an elementary teacher and she had 
children that had type uh -huh. 1 diabetes, uh, juvenile diabetes, and she had to keep certain things in her room when she mm -hmm. had those kids in her class to give them whenever they'd have a crash so right. that they would get an immediate surge. And oftentimes when adults get those crashes, when they've been type 1 diabetics and, and when they crash, they're sweaty and mm -hmm. clammy mm -hmm. and, and they, they feel kind of nauseated. And for the children, they, they, it was extreme and they would uh, oftentimes be disoriented. Now, the kind of low blood sugar that you can get if you don't have type 1. So you could either have type 2 diabetes or you just have prediabetes. You're just very sensitive mm -hmm. to insulin. Which is also a controversial label. There are some doctors who say there's no such thing. That when your triglycerides reach a certain level, then you're not bad. And your blood sugar reaches a certain level. Yeah. So, yeah, they say that, but that's not true because <laughs> everything leads up to it. You start gaining weight, and it's a never-ending cycle. You gain weight, then you don't have enough insulin. So, so basically, you have hypoglycemia, you eat more sugar, you right. store more fat, and you gain weight, and you have... You don't have enough insulin to take care of the circle. body size that yeah. you have. So then you have to take something to make you insulin sensitive and drop your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of diabetes. But it can also cause prediabetes and type 2 can give you low blood sugar and can give you a hot flash. So, so I have a friend who's in her mid-50s. Mm -hmm. She's from Central Europe. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't like the American diet and mm -hmm. she eats according to her, mostly fruits. And she's complaining a lot in our conversations about menopause and hot flashes. Mm -hmm. So should I suggest to her that she speak to her doctor to see if this is a uh, another cause of night sweats than menopause? Yeah, they would have to look at her fasting blood sugar. They'd have to do a three-hour glucose tolerance test mm -hmm. to see if she goes way up and then tr crashes. But any... I would advise her, anyone who just eats fruits right. is on a, the wrong diet. I, I mean, it's... We've you, had that conversation. You can't make muscle without protein. Your building blocks of your body require muscle, excuse me, pr protein, and require fats, and require sugars from, from fruit and from other sources like bread. Right. But the amounts that you eat are different. But eating all fruit, that doesn't give you everything you need. No. And that will lead to some type of malnutrition. So, having said that, we've solved that problem. But she could have hot flashes well, secondary to hypo right. hypoglycemia instead of just her out. hormones. Yes, exactly. So, basically, I, I went through the diet. And you can all look through your own diets. But, peop but this was a particular difficulty because this patient stated, and I knew she was very compulsive and always watched what she was doing. She said, I'm on a low-carb diet. Yeah. And people who are on a low-carb diet and stick with it don't get hypoglycemic mm -hmm. because the sh it's the added sugar that increases your insulin, which then takes all the sugar out of your blood and makes fat. And that's sugar from carbs, not from processed sugar. Yeah, it doesn't have like to be. candy bars all day. It doesn't have to be candy bars. It can be Pasta, it can be breads, it can be potatoes. any yeah, potatoes, any type type of carbohydrate. However, she described her diet all day, mm -hmm. which was all very good, very balanced. She ate every four hours. It was excellent. And she's very tiny. So I didn't expect anything. And then she told me that, oh, she's really bad before she goes to bed. She eats like cinnamon rolls and I mean, really really things that really are high in sugar, which then physiologically would make her increase her blood sugar and then drop it. By the time she's waking up, she would be hypoglycemic and sweating. And she stated that the hot flashes always stopped at breakfast. And for breakfast, she'd eat eggs, which, which, which again is protein. Which would be a type 1 diabetes type, type, type 2. Type 2? Mm -hmm. It's type 2 diabetes. She doesn't have type 1 diabetes. She doesn't have high blood sugar. She has, she has gone through the normal so process. through the cycle while she was sleeping. Right. Okay. And so that made her blood sugar really low. It went high first, dropped okay. down, and then it stayed down for the morning. And until she ate again, she didn't feel right. So and she had do hot her flashes. hot flashes typically come at the same time every night? Mm -hmm. They come every day before breakfast. Yeah. And so that was one of the reasons timing is everything. Usually people with hot flashes have them all night and are better 
when they wake up and that's when your pituitary is mo most active so if the hot flashes are from low estrogen or low testosterone usually that's at night so she her timing was off so I had to figure out where it came from so I put her on a different kind of diet I took away all those goodies and I had her take a protein shake before dinner I mean before bed so that would hold her without making her sugar go up and down and I haven't heard from her but I'm sure that it's better now. Yeah, because it was just in the last week or so right. that she came in. Yeah. Right. So, so interestingly enough, this is one of those things that isn't obvious. So what my process is, you have to fix everything else. Like I have to make sure hot flashes aren't from. Rule, rule out this, rule out that. Rule it all out. And yeah. say she had a, a low, she was doing this and she had a low thyroid. Yeah. Well, I treat that. Hot flashes are still there. Mm-hmm. Um, if she had hot flashes, I treat it with enough estrogen. Now, some people still have hot flashes when they get estrogen from their doctors because oral estrogen or, or um, patches are at such a low dose. The, the amount approved by the FDA is so low, it doesn't always stop hot flashes. So they could, you can still take estrogen and get hot flashes, but, and it's not something else. It's just not enough medicine. Well, and that's back to previous podcasts that we've had about dosing to the norm versus dosing to the symptom. Right, you know? right, but they don't dose to the norm or the symptom. Right. They just dose low. They just one size fits all, take this low dose, yeah. and a high dose is dangerous, it isn't, but they consider high dose what we have when we're cycling. Mm -hmm. And that's not high dose, it's what our bodies are used to. So when you're thinking about having a hot flash, then you have to rule out all these other causes. And you have to make sure you're not eating like ding-dongs before you go to bed. I mean, that's really a bad habit. And all her other habits were great. And she even exercised and she she had snacks appropriately and in, with the right food. And she wasn't gaining any weight. It was just that she felt terrible in the morning. So And she called it a hot flash. Mm -hmm. So we have to, as doctors, sort through what these symptoms are and make sure those symptoms aren't from something else. And if I had not found anything, I would have sent her to a cardiologist to get a Holter to see. Holter is a constant evaluation of your heart for like two weeks or a month. It depends on you how long it, it takes. It, it, it transmits what your heart's doing. So mm -hmm. if your heart's skipping beats, then we'll see it. And you're supposed to write down when you get your hot flashes or your symptoms, whatever those may be. Some people get out of breath. So and, they can correlate them to see. right. Yeah, it and my the heart. yeah, my husband just went through that, you know, for having, and he was skipping a lot of uh, ventricular beats. Was he having hot flashes? He was sweating. He was just breaking out in a sweat for no reason. For was no he exercising or anything. No, just he, was, suddenly he, he was just sitting there, and he'd break out in a sweat. And so after a while, I I managed. You, you thought you were making him nervous. Turns out you weren't. <laughs> I thought I was trying to man. I was trying to go over his hormones, and then finally I just said, "You need to see the cardiologist." And and they they then confirmed it and treated it, and so he doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. So it can be something else. Right. But everybody else, if he had been female, everybody else would have just said, "That's just a hot flash." You know, go him, see him ya, see ya, gene. live or yeah. live with it. You know, which is well, what most what about doctors adrenal say. Fatigue? Adrenal fatigue is when your cortisol the the cortisol goes down and that has to do here's the process of adrenal fatigue somebody is so stressed and so stressed that they are using up cortisol all the time their cortisol is elevated all the time so so their baseline of anxiety is so high, high. that the adrenaline is always flooding the system right and the adrenaline and the cortisol so mm -hmm. their cortisone is going up so they're in fight or flight all the time right so that they are used to a higher level of cortisol and they get to a point where their adrenal is actually fatigued. It can't produce right. enough adrenaline or enough cortisol to actually get them through a stressful situation mm -hmm. and the adrenal crashes. And so they, the adrenal they get can't, they can't, yes, they can't get enough cortisol or enough uh, adrenaline to to go through everyday life people like this feel like they're like oh my gosh i can't get out of bed they can't go to sleep either usually their cortisol will go up a little bit at night instead of during the morning which is the wrong time so right. it keeps them awake and they usually feel like that every time they stand up they get dizzy their blood pressure drops i mean every part of the adrenal stops working and, and so these are people that wouldn't come in and say i'm having panic attacks these are people whose stress levels uh, are so high. I mean, they're like 
stimulus junkies. Uh, or who, they, they've just been through a some few trauma traumas that's in a row. Ongoing. Right. Yes. So they've reset their norm, their baseline for tolerance. And they've overworked and they their they've adrenal. Depleted their system. Right. They've overworked their adrenal until it can't it can't respond anymore and then it, it's fatigued so it stops working. Yeah. So what we do so the way we tie hot flashes into this mm -hmm. is that then their pituitary gland starts putting out a lot of stimul stimulus stimulus Right. to the adrenal trying to get it to work it's kind of like trying to get an ovary that's that's menopausal to work the the pituitary is putting out the stimulatory hormone ACTH and it keeps going up and then as it surges you get a hot flash so they're getting hot flashes if I'm treating them and I've given them estrogen it's not from that mm -hmm. and I've given them testosterone in every case and it's not from that but I've looked at their cortisol and it's really low. So when the cortisol is really low and ACTH is really high, that can be a hot flash. So these are people who are exhausted and have hot flashes. Now that so could be So sitting in the conference menopause. with you is like watching Dr. House, the <laughs> diagnostician, who just goes through all these things to find out why is this person not responding to the standard treatment assumptions that we make. It must be estrogen. They're a 55-year-old woman. They've got sweats. And they give them estrogen and nothing changes. And so then you have to figure out why. There was a thing in medical school and it said, when you're, when you're in the U.S. Yeah. and you hear a stampede, you should look for horses. Okay? <laughs> so, But I would never listen to that because I was always looking for zebras. Because anybody can find a horse in the U.S., but not many people can find a zebra. And so I was always looking for that other case, the case that wasn't typical. Now, yeah. I, I have to say I use my, my cases that... I've seen a hundred times, it makes it so much easier to diagnose because I'm like, I've seen this before. It's it's obvious, so it's easier to diagnose. I get a little lab material to back it up. President but, Bill Clinton says the same thing. If you're walking down a country road and you see a turtle on a fence post, you can assume he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> you're right. You have to be able he to had look some great lines. at the information. He yeah, did. he had some great lines. And the last thing I wanted to say on adrenal fatigue is sometimes it is not caused by stress. Sometimes it's caused by doctors giving you cortisol for other reasons. You have to take it to stay alive. So that so you, it like may be asthma, a cost it may be a, a side effect of something that right. you were treated for because you just needed steroids. Well, the steroids shut down your adrenal and it doesn't start back up. That's what happened with Kennedy. Right. He, his adrenals failed yeah. because he was on steroids for his back pain. And so he had to take every one of the adrenal hormones as a shot. Or Addison's disease. Addison's disease is what it's called. Very good. Very Came good. Came out of nowhere. That's, that's, com that's complete, um, not just adrenal fatigue, it's complete shutdown of the adrenal gland. Yeah. And you have to have all your hormones from the adrenal. They manage a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And replaced. So that's another cause. And... That would probably still give you uh, hot flashes or, or surges from your pituitary unless you are well treated. Right. Once you're treated, all those flashes go away because then the adrenal, the uh, pituitary can calm down, stop sending all these messages. So I can't call myself house because I don't work in a hospital. So I'm going to have well, to call I myself and, like and it's a, a TV office. show, but it's, it's something people would <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. But these are the things that you should think about when you're not better and your doctor says, well, you should be better. Right. So then you say, let's find out why. Don't just go away and say, oh, well, nothing I, works. Or say, I know there's other causes of hot flashes or yeah. hot sweats. Right. I know they're there. I know that they're from many other symptom systems besides just your ovaries or Men get hot flashes, too, when testicular failure hits. So if those have been treated, you can at least go to your doctor and say, well, I've got those treated, so now what else can you do for me? Find out what or else I have. you can I say, have. doctor, I was watching this medical show on the Internet. And, this <laughs> and that'll make said... him turn off immediately <laughs> <laughs> or her. But that'll it challenges their knowledge. So sometimes that's not helpful. But um, it's probably better to approach them a different way. But, but the, end of, the end of the day, the end of the message is to say, again, it's in your best interest to be a knowledgeable consumer of your own medical care and to recognize that sometimes there are other explanations. And don't just settle for panacea of, well, that's the way it is, or eventually it will go away. Because it could kill you. Yeah, it could.
And those are things that you should, these are the things that we discussed can be really serious illnesses. So you can't just let them go. The dominoes start to fall and we want to prevent that from happening or we want to restore them if we can do that. So good medical care can help more often than we know. And if you're a doctor, start looking for zebras. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.